maintenance, operation, and care for the letterpress equipment that we provide. The MCAD print shop features a show card proofing press, a Kelsey tabletop press, a Vandercook 219 cylinder press, and large fonts of both metal and wood type. The show card press. The show card press, also known as a poster press or proofing press, can be used to take proofs of metal type. It can also be used to create large scale prints of wood type or metal type using the included guides. These metal guides come in a variety of lengths and are secured using this metal guide bar. Both the type and the bar fits into the metal slots at the bottom and the top of the press, allowing infinite levels of adjustability. MCAT has a variety of useful metal fonts designed specifically for use with the show card poster press. Many of the large wooden type fonts and the metal fonts in the drawers nearby have little slots in the back that fit right over the guide bars to ensure they stay secure when printing. Spacing and magnets are used to hold the type in place. Many of the magnets have a slot. This allows them to slide right on top of the metal guide bars. Here you can see me setting up the poster press for use. The main guide bar is secured using the slots, and the smaller metal guides are placed at different intervals to allow you to space your type. Many of the wooden type faces have multiple slots, and you may need to adjust the smaller guide bars to fit. Once you have your type in place, you can use the magnets to keep it secure when you take your prints. The slotted magnets fit right over these smaller guides. Some of the larger magnets can be placed in between guides directly against the type. Once you've ensured that your type is secure, you can make a selection from one of our many inks. Both letterpress and etching inks can be used on the show card press, as long as they aren't mixed. Brayers are included in the cabinets above and to the right of the show card press. Palette knives are located around the print shop, but there are some hanging right above the show card press. This is how ink would be prepared for use on the show card press. Many of the etching inks may have a skin. In order to access the useful ink beneath, it is important that you push the skin gently out of the way. Do not gouge the ink cans, but instead gently move it to the side so that you can secure some of the ink beneath. The glass tabletop to the right of the show card press is specifically designed for laying out and spreading ink. Once you are finished collecting the ink you need, close the can and return it to its place. Then roll out the ink into a nice, smooth film. With an inked brayer, spread the ink on the type, approaching from different angles to ensure an even coat. Now that the type is inked, it's important to place a sheet of paper directly on the type. Dampening the paper may ensure a deeper, smoother print. Once the paper is placed, you may add some of the packing. The show card press is adjustable, and you will need to adjust your packing accordingly. Here you can see the adjustment knobs that are used to heighten or lower the roller. Try and keep these even to ensure a nice, smooth print. When you are ready to take a print, guide the tympan down the press and pull it over top of your type. You should feel some resistance, but it shouldn't be so tight that it's impossible to pull it over top. If you don't want to take a second impression, pull the metal handle and it will lift the roller above the type, preventing it from taking a second impression. The Kelsey Press This is our 8x10 Kelsey Press. It is excellent for doing small prints such as stationery or business cards. 
Here's some of the basic anatomy of the press, including the rollers, the chase with a photopolymer base, the tympan, and the ink disc. Here are some of the tools you might need to use the Kelsey press to print photopolymer. Here you can see my photopolymer, a piece of acetate, some paper cut to size, some scissors, and some scrap paper. You may also notice to the right that there is some furniture, coins, keys, and gauge pins which are used to secure both the paper and the base into the press. Here I am removing the chase. All of your type or your photopolymer base must be locked into the chase. On the back there is a handle that you can lift. Gently lift out the base, but do not let the platen fall forward. Here you can see me locking in an aluminum boxcar base. These are specifically designed for use with photopolymer and work well on the Kelsey press. Here I'm using a speed coin to lock it in from the top. I will also be placing a second speed coin at the bottom. It's important that the base is both level and locked in tightly. Here I'm using a reglet to ensure that it's just a little bit tighter. Once you have your base positioned properly and the proper furniture, you can lock it in by using a coin key to tighten the coins. Once your type or base are properly locked in, they shouldn't budge. It's important to do this on a flat surface to ensure that it isn't lifted on one side and will print evenly. Here I am preparing the photopolymer for use on the base. Photopolymer that's plastic backed is easy to cut with scissors and can be adjusted or cut down to size. Photopolymer can be ordered from Boxcar Press using their online ordering form. It can also be made at MCAT if you have the proper training and are able to use the exposure unit. When you're ready to place your photopolymer, peel off the plastic backing, but don't throw it away. You can use this to store your photopolymer plates for later. They can last for many years if you keep the backing clean. Place the adhesive side onto the base using the grid to prepare your alignment. Try and keep your images to the bottom left hand corner of the base. This will ensure that you do not smash the gauge pins later. When you're ready to return the chase to the press, ensure that it is locked up properly and that your photopolymer is nice and flat on the base. In this shot you can see the handle on the back that's used to lift the pin which holds the chase and the base into place. Now it's time to check our packing and replace it if necessary. If the packing is very dirty or badly dented, you can replace it using the following steps. Lift the two slotted guide bars. Pull out the paper and cut new timp into size. When you are ready to replace the packing, you can slide it right under these little slotted guide bars which hold the paper in place. You can see I've pre-creased it just to make it a little bit easier to snap into place. Using a micrometer, you can be sure to get the perfect measurement. For a deeper impression on your paper, you may need to add one more extra sheet of packing. For the back sheets of packing, I did not crease them. I only creased the top sheet so that they would stay in place. Once everything is tightly into the little locked guide bars, you shouldn't have a problem with this back packing sliding out. In order to ensure that it all stays nice and secure, you can see I'm pulling the edges of the top sheet a little just to make sure that they're tight behind the lock bars. You can use these metal gauge pins to hold your paper in place when you print. Sometimes they pop apart. This is how you reassemble them. Once you have them together, you can see that the brass insert can be raised or lowered to help hold your paper in place. You can also create photopolymer gauge pins using scraps of blank photopolymer. These are great because they do not smash or break.
When using the Kelsey press, please use the rubber based inks that are also used for the Vandercook press. Do not put etching inks on this press because they can dry into the rollers and make it really difficult to clean. Inking up the Kelsey is very simple. Simply spread a thin amount of ink onto the ink disc. You can then either raise and lower the Kelsey handle to spread the ink or speed things up by using a brayer. Using the brayer is not necessary, but it does make things a little quicker because it allows the ink to spread nice and evenly on the rollers on their first pass, which prevents sticky globs of ink from getting on your plate. Now it's time to set up our paper for our lineup with our plate. Use your eye at first. Here you can see I'm using the photopolymer gauge pins instead of the metal ones. Just like using the photopolymer on the base, you simply have to peel off the sticky backing and put it in place. Here you can see me gently raising the temp in so that I can compare how close I am to the paper. This allows me to use my eye to better judge how to move the paper and the pins. Here you can see me using a metal pin. These metal gauge pins are actually punched into the temp and top sheet. Try not to punch through all the layers of paper and that way they can be used later for more press runs. It is vitally important that if you use metal gauge pins that they are out of the way of the base. If you're using a metal base, these pins can smash against the aluminum base, denting both the base and breaking the pins, which are new old stock and difficult to replace. Once again, you can see me raising the tip in just to double check that the press is not going to make contact with the pins and smash them. When you're ready to take your first print, a little trick I like to use is to put some acetate cut to size on top of your paper. This way you can take a print on the acetate and compare it onto your paper without wasting extra scraps. This saves both a lot of newsprint and a lot of your nice paper. You can see I've even drawn some lines on my acetate to help me create the lineup. This is a great technique when you're printing in multiple colors that need to be lined up. Most presses have a set of paper guards that help hold the paper in place. This press is missing them, so you can see sometimes paper may fall into the press. Print slowly and you can also overcome this by adding another gauge pin. Here you can see the full step of pulling a print. It's as simple as sliding a piece of paper into your gauge pins, pulling a print, taking it out, and replacing it with the next sheet of paper. This can go very quickly once you get into the rhythm of printing. Just keep an eye on your prints to make sure your gauge pins haven't shifted and that everything is in line. In this shot, you can see I've added an extra small gauge pin to the right. This will help keep the paper from falling into the press like it did earlier. You can see now we've overcome the problem of the paper falling out. We can also see a nice even inking. When you are finished printing, gently remove the sticky gauge pins and the brass gauge pins. Now I'm going to show how to thoroughly clean the press. Raise the rollers up onto the inking disc and remove them by pulling out the pin on the right hand side. Gently remove the rollers, being careful not to drop the trucks. They may fall and roll away and be lost or crack the glass. Repeat with the second roller. The roller arms are on springs so you can gently lift the little slots and slide the rollers out without much difficulty. It's important that you clean the rollers right away since they're expensive to replace and sensitive to the ink. Use only California wash so that it doesn't damage the rollers. You can set one end against a cloth or a sheet of newsprint so that you can gently wipe them clean with a minimal amount of spirits. You can also pull off your photopolymer and replace the blue backing. This will ensure that it stays clean and safe for future use. Clean the inking disc as you normally would, using mineral spirits and a rag. Then replace the rollers. You can see how I'm able to lift the slots and put them onto the edges. Don't forget to add the trucks, which go in between the roll arms and the rollers. Kelsey's have free moving trucks, which are slightly different than other rollers where the trucks may be already attached to the cores. 
This simply means that they, don't, they aren't attached and they can roll away or get lost, so keep an eye on them. When you're finished, put the pin back in the right roller arm to ensure the rollers lock into place. Always store the rollers down, not against the ink disc. This way that they will be suspended and won't be dented or damaged. The Vandercook 219. This is MCAD's Vandercook 219. It's an excellent cylinder press that can take large prints up to 15 inches wide. Here you can see our largest boxcar base on the press bed. Make a note of some of the Vandercook anatomy, the rubber rollers, the top assembly, the tympan, the grippers, the feed board, and the press bed. Here we have some rubber-based inks that are specifically for use with this press. You can use the coins and the keys that were used for the Kelsey for this press as well. They're used to lock up type or the bases to ensure they don't shift during printing. Below the press are a series of drawers in which many of the tools are stored. Here you can see ink being mixed on a glass slab. It's important to use these rubber-based inks because they don't dry out easily and thus won't damage the press. Still, it is important to make sure that you thoroughly clean the press after every use to ensure they don't get into any of the moving parts. This is the proper way to mix ink with a spinning motion to ensure an even application of a color. In order to operate the press, you need to turn on the switch. Turn it on once or twice quickly to make sure you don't hear any unusual grinding noises. Once you've done that, lower the top assembly. You can then add the ink. The top assembly rollers may not start moving until you've added the ink because the ink adds a necessary amount of friction. You can apply the ink to the top assembly center roller right here. Make a nice long even smear to make sure that the inking goes quicker and more easily. Give it a little push and then you will see the press ink up. Give the press a minute or two to thoroughly ink before you try taking any prints. At the top of the press near the feed board on the tympan are a couple of copper guides. These can be used to slightly angle your paper or make minute adjustments once you've lined up your print. This copper guide on the top of the feed board is used to make the main adjustments. Here you can see unlocking the top wheel allows you to make major adjustments and screwing in or out the back wheel allows you to make minor adjustments. In letterpress, all measurements are done using a picometer or line gauge. Picas and points are the main way of measuring type and book measurements. Here you can see me using a line gauge to ensure that my type is even on the page. Here's a shot of how the tympan rolls down the press bed to take a print. Beneath it you can see the moving roller. Be cautious of this roller and make sure that all of your hair is tied back so that it doesn't get caught. In order to take your first print you will need to press on the pedal. What this does is it raises the copper pins at the top of the press and switches the press into print mode. There's a little switch on the right hand side that can be toggled between print and trip. Print will take a print and trip will allow you to roll the cylinder down to the end without it inking against your print paper. It's important that you note this handle which can raise and lower the top assembly. Raising the top assembly will keep the press rollers from running and also keep it from taking an inked print. Here you can see my favorite technique for lining up photopolymer plates. This only works with plastic back plates, but it's a really effective way of getting a perfect lineup. Using a sheet of acetate on top of your print you, and a little bit of double stick tape, you can place the print with the type side to the paper onto your guide below. Then peel off the backing. Switch the press to trip mode so that it doesn't ink and remove your guide sheet of paper. Then you can simply roll the tympan down to the edge of the press bed. This will deposit the print onto the base. The reason this works is because the double stick tape is not as strong as the adhesive used on the back of these plates. 
You can now check your print and make sure that it's even on the base. Here you can see another angle of how it works. Check the grid to make sure that it's, your photopolymer plate is nice and even on the base. Then remove any extra double stick tape from your acetate so you can use it over again. You can see I've added guidelines. Another great trick is to actually take your first print on the acetate and then compare it over top of your original print. This will keep you from wasting paper and it will also allow you to make minor adjustments. Here you can see me comparing the lineup on the acetate to the print below. This can be great when printing in multiple colors. This is a side view of how the press operates. When you roll the tympan all the way to the end of the press bed, it will make a click which releases the paper and allows you to put it back on the feed board. Please be cautious of others and make sure to roll the tympan all the way to the end of the press bed. This ensures that it properly resets for you to take your next print. It will automatically go back into trip mode or non-print taking mode every time you bring it back to the feed board. You will need to press the pedal every single time you want to take a print, both to raise the grippers and slide the paper underneath and to reset the press into print mode. Here you can see a better view of how pressing the pedals lifts the guide pins Slide your paper so that it's straight against the copper guides and also against the main guide at the top of the feed board. From this view, you can see how the tympan rolls all the way down to the end of the press bed and clicks to release the paper. Cleaning up is one of the most important things about letterpress printing. When you are finished with one plate, remove it and return it to its backing so that you don't lose it. Now I'm going to show a thorough cleaning of the Vandercook 219. It is imperative that you wear gloves when cleaning to protect your hands from the chemicals. The first step is to remove the top assembly, which can be a little confusing at first. You must lift it up, Bring it all the way to one side to get one side out, and then lift it out. Removing the bottom assembly is a little easier. Simply lift the little copper locks and slide it forward. The first step is to clean the moving roller. You must leave the roller on because it's impossible to rotate when the press is turned off. Apply a little bit of mineral spirits or California wash, and then use a rag to remove as much of the ink as possible. This may take a minute or two, but if you haven't over-inked the press, it shouldn't be too difficult. Although I've sped up the video a little bit, I want to show you the full process of cleaning because it's really important that you have an attention to detail with this. Be sure to clean all the areas around the roller and the sides of it as well because ink tends to become trapped on the edges and people often leave it for many years before it gets thoroughly cleaned. One rag should be sufficient for cleaning the moving roller. Try to limit your use of rags and choose ones from the half dirty container for your initial cleaning. Once you are finished, use a mostly clean rag to do any final cleaning of the edges. It's important to get all of the ink off. Here you will see me cleaning the rubber rollers. These can be the most difficult part to clean, especially if you use dark ink because it can be difficult to see. Here you can see me rotating the rollers to get a nice even coat of mineral spirits on them. I always like to finish the rollers off at the end with a little bit of California wash because it's more gentle on the rubber. 
Cleaning the top assembly is pretty simple, especially because the ink removes easily from the metal surface. Try not to get too much mineral spirits onto the worm, which is the little gear you see on the right hand side. This area sometimes needs to be re-oiled to keep it moving nice and smooth. Any loud squeaking you may hear may be from it not being oiled properly. Once again, I sped up the video a little, but I still think it's really important that you watch the full cleaning to see how it should look when it's finished. Once the top assembly is thoroughly cleaned, you may need to add a little bit of lubrication in the form of Vaseline to the worm. This will ensure that the press moves nice and smoothly for the next person who prints. Add a teeny amount of Vaseline and then roll the center roller back and forth to get it spread evenly. Add a little bit to the other side too. Once you've lubricated it, go over the top assembly one more time with a clean rag to remove any extra petroleum jelly or ink. In addition to adding Vaseline, you may need to oil the small rollers on the top assembly. You can see me using an oil can with an extended nozzle here. Don't add too much or it may drip into the ink, but you do need to add a drop or two and then spin the rollers to get it moving. This will stop any loud squeaking or strange noises on the press, in most cases. Once you finish that, return the top assembly to its proper location. Insert one side first and make sure that the pins rest on the copper. Also ensure that the operator tag is close to the orange handle. You can see that these gears line up with that gear track. Clean down the press bed and the aluminum base if you used it. Wipe down everything one more time with a little bit of California wash. Make sure that you get the ink off of all the other bars on the press that may have become dirty when you were removing the top assembly. Once you are finished cleaning, it's important to put the rags where they belong. Really dirty rags should go in the red dirty rag can. Rags that are not too dirty and can be used again should go in the half dirty rag can. Now we're going to discuss oiling the press. You can see that there are some little felt pads behind the tippin and below on both sides under the gear track. These ensure that the press runs smoothly and that the metal doesn't get too much wear. Add a few drops to all of the felt pads. There are also some oil ports on the top. Here you can see they're marked with a little bit of red. Flip up the little tops, insert the extended nozzle, and drip a few drops of oil. Remember, where you find one oil port, there's likely one on the other side. So make sure you get the felt pads on those sides as well. The press should be oiled every few print runs, but you can oil it every print run if you prefer. When you are finished thoroughly cleaning, it's time to put away and store any extra ink. You can use tin ink cans as I have here for large quantities, or you can make a folded little foil packet, sometimes called a taco, to preserve any extra mixed ink. Fold out a flat piece of foil and gently scrape the extra ink into it. Be sure to get off as much as you can from the glass using this method. 
because it's much harder to take off large globs of ink with a rag. When you've put all of the ink into the foil packet, simply fold it up into a nice little square, closing up the ends to ensure that no ink leaks out. Label it and put it in your flat file or label it for use for other students. Once you are done printing, it's important to cover the press to keep dust and debris from getting into the rollers. It's also highly important that you lead the top assembly up. The black handle knob should be raised up. This is important because it prevents the rollers from being dented. Also ensure that the orange handle is visible so no one runs into it. Advanced Skills Here I'm going to demonstrate the guillotine. It's important to note that you may not use the guillotine until you've had an in-person instruction. Make adjustments to the back guide by rolling the wheel on the front of the guillotine. Then, once you have it at the exact length you would like to cut, you can begin to lower the top guide. Slip a few pieces of chipboard below your paper stack and above your paper stack. There should be at least three pieces of chipboard below your paper and two above it to prevent the guide from squeezing it and making a dent. Then lower the top guide all the way until your paper is nice and tight. This way it won't budge when you bring down the blade. Pull the handle all the way to the left until it slides through the entire stack of paper. If you have a very thick stack of paper, you may need to bring down the blade a second time to get to the final few sheets. Once you are done, release the top wheel and then you can pull your paper stack out of the guillotine. In this video, I'm going to do a dry demo of how to adjust roller height. Adjusting the roller height can be very important because it ensures an even print. This metal type high gauge, sometimes called a lollipop, is used to check the ink level. The way this is done is to slide it through sideways underneath the rollers, then turn it. You should feel a bit of tension as it runs across the roller and you'll see a little stripe of ink. This is how you determine how low or high the rollers are. The rollers can be adjusted by using an Allen wrench. Open up this center bolt on both sides of the lower rollers. Then use a screwdriver to bring the rollers up or down. Check the roller height again. Continue to make adjustments, knowing that when you finally tighten the Allen wrench at the end, they will lower a tiny little fraction. Now I'm going to show how to change the packing on this press. First use the screwdriver to loosen the screws up here near the copper guides. You must loosen all of the screws. This will cause the tin and paper to come loose. You can then lift it out of the little valley. Pull out the underneath packing and roll the press down to the end of the press bed so that you can remove the top sheet. The tail of the top sheet is wrapped around a square bar that's used to tighten the packing. Timpin is located in the office. Cut a new sheet to match the same general shape of the top sheet. When replacing the packing, put the top sheet in first. Here you can see me sliding the first edge into that little valley between the paper guides and the feed board. Give it a nice crease and then tighten with the screwdriver. Now that the top sheet is tight, lift it and slide in your other packing. Be sure to use the same amount of sheets that was on the press before. Slowly roll forward the tympan, ensuring that the inner packing doesn't fall out. Make sure that you adjust it so it's nice and even and tight underneath the top sheet. Then, taking the top sheet, which may or may not already be creased, you can begin to wrap it around the metal bar. 
slide it through underneath and begin wrapping it around, creasing as you go. Once it's hand tight, lift up the little latch. You can then use a wrench to tighten it a little bit more. The tension of this little latch will hold it in place. Here you can see at the end, I've used a wrench just to click it that few extra clicks to ensure that the packing is nice and tight. It won't slide around during printing. Use your best judgment. You want it pretty tight, but not overly tight. Make sure you have permission before ever using any tools on the press. This is definitely an advanced skill that should be supervised the first time you do it. I hope you enjoyed this instructional letterpress video. For more resources, speak with your instructor or the print shop coordinator. Thank you.